Hi, I'm Rusty Dornan with the Coffin Fellows Academy and Novo Ed. And joining me here today again for our second hangout is Chris Lip. He's the author of the Startup Pitch, a proven formula for winning funding. And he's also a Stanford business coach and has coached many folks in the Silicon Valley and helped them secure funding. Welcome, Chris. I know we're going to be talking about the elements of persuasion today. So talk a little bit about that. What do you mean by elements of persuasion? So if you have gone to the course and you've seen the lectures, you know that a formula for pitching is great. It's what you need to do in order to win funding. But that doesn't mean that it's enough because there will still be a number of people who have a great formula just like you. They have the same formula, um, but they're going to be more convincing, right? They have that uh, je ne sais quoi, if you will, that nor my presentation, I just came back from France. But they have something in it that makes it really attractive. And so what the elements of uh, persuasion are, they are the elements that ensure that people, that the investors believe what you're saying. They're essentially the proof points that say, hey, this is not just a guy who is saying it with words and sounds good. This is a real, this is the real deal. What are those elements? What are the key things that you really need to have in order to persuade somebody to, to fund your startup or to believe your pitch? <laughs> In 2001, we, we were very lucky. We have a lot of research to go from, right? So 2001, a guy named Jay Conger published an article on Harvard Business Review. He found after four years of field research that every single proposal, literally every proposal in large companies and small companies that was accepted, even small companies getting investment, they all had the same four elements. And those four elements were focus on the audience, uh, value to the audience, essentially. Um, for example, Benefits is a great value. Uh, talking about problem pains, anything that emphasizes more why this is important to the person listening. The second thing is credibility. So why are you the right person to be doing this? Why are you the right person to understand the problem? Why are you the right person to be able to develop a solution and run a business? I mean, if you can't explain that, then an investor, they're going to hear similar ideas. They might say, hey, okay, you have a good idea, but so does this guy. A similar idea, but they have a better team, right? So let's go with them. You don't want that, right? You want to be the one that says, hey, we're the best to do this. The so, like, third thing is data. Uh, we all know data is persuasive. Uh, we almost, actually, I think to a detriment, most people give too much data. Uh, mm. If you look at, for example, TechCrunch disrupt pitches, just to give you a, a kind of segue to something, TechCrunch disrupt pitches, the ones that win the contests, the big annual contest held in New York and San Francisco, um, they generally have five to seven minute pitches, right? And they get $50,000 for winning. It's just ridiculous how much money they get for seven minutes of talking, right? And then often millions more in investment because they are a winner. Uh, they usually have one to two data points in their seven minute pitch. So one to two data points. Now during Q and A, you know, in a real pitch, it's almost all there's a lot of Q and A, right? During Q and A, they bring up more. The heart of their pitch is not data heavy; it just has a few key points of data that really emphasize something important. For example, the number of people suffering, right? The market. And then the fourth thing is, of course, having an emotional component. For example, having an anecdote, a story. Uh, your demo handles this, right? So you can demo something and say, hey, here's how it works, which is really OK, but it's kind of boring. The best way to demo is from a you know, hypothetical example, um, because then you actually are bringing a story element into the situation. So if you have these four things, a focus on the audience, you have credibility, you've got data, and you've got kind of that emotion or a story or some use case, um, it's way more persuasive than just saying, hey, people suffer. And you know, uh, we've got some viewers now, and I would encourage them to ask questions. This is your opportunity to, you know, ask questions about elements of influence and persuasion or about anything else you want to know in the course, because this will be our last live hangout during the course. So don't uh, don't waste the opportunity. Um, the other thing is I, we're going to go through each of those elements again. I know you provided some examples already for the uh, the points of per the elements of persuasion, but I want to go through them again. Also, you talk about taking each those elements we just talked about, the cred, you know, the, the credibility, the data, the emotional connection and all that. And you, in the book, you talk about applying it also to each of the four points of the framework. Yes. So talk about that a little bit. I mean, does that, if people get confused by that, I mean, that sounds like a lot. 
Well, for example, I, I just, I literally just finished coaching somebody before we jumped on the hangout. And what they wanted to do is, you know, start their problem, but give an example of a customer with a problem, right? And then bring in the solution and then talk about how now their solution solved that customer's problem. So they have a little bit of story, right? Of this customer talking, showing, showing the problem, not just saying the problem. And then when they solved it, they went back and they showed how their solution actually solve this customer's issue. So in that sense, you've got a little bit of story in both, right? You're talking a little bit about this and that. You can give data in both. You can give data, hey, there are thousand people suffering with this issue, right? And we, so the data reinforces how bad the problem is. And you talk about the solution, you say, our solution is so great that, you know, 98% of customers, you know, are able to resolve their issues within two days. So you're bringing in data to support the solution. Mm -hmm. Think about, regardless of what you say, whether you're going to do problem solution, you're going to bring in the benefits, you can always convey that information, not just as words, I mean with words, right, but not just saying it. You can always bring in data to support it, to evidence it or prove it. You can bring in an anecdote or you can bring in a story to prove it, to evidence it. You know, you're saying that there are, a thousand people who are not able to do their taxes properly, right? There's a million people who have problems doing their taxes. You're just making a statement. That's a good problem. But now show me the data. Show me an anecdote that help me understand how they're suffering. That's what makes it real for the investor. Okay. Uh, let's go through credibility. What are some of the different ways you can establish credibility? You know, there's, as you said, there's more than one, right? Yeah, there's a lot of ways to establish credibility. I, I mean, you can talk about yourself and your background, how it's relevant, right, to, to the situation. That's one. Uh, another way is you can borrow the credibility of somebody else. So you can quote experts in the field. Um, you can, that's, that's probably the easiest way. You can invite the expert in to validate what you're saying. That happened with a, a startup I coached. Um, what they did is they got on a call with an investor and they had a director from Stanford Hospital on board to talk about why their medical device was actually real. The third way is, of course, you just cite data that you're bringing in that supports what you're saying. So these are, you know, we're talking about these elements, but they give a much more convincing pitch when you bring them into what you're saying. You know, what is the best way to establish it, though, out of those? What do you think is the most powerful? Well, it's, it great, or all, all of them. You know, it's interesting. Even in, in a, if you're in a big company, a pitch is still a pitch, right? Even if you're talking to uh, a, an executive, you may not talk about the market and the business the same way that you would if you were an investor, or I mean a startup to an investor. But you're going to go up to an executive. You're going to say, hey, the company's got this problem, right? And then you can show data that the company's got this problem. You can say, here's the solution that we think is going to work, that we know is going to work, right? We're going to do this. Here's the data that suggests that. Here's an anecdote of how that looks so you understand it. And, you know, why do I know this? I've, I've worked in this department for 10 years. I know exactly how this department runs. But let's say you don't. So, for example, in the, the HBR article from 2001 where I'm pulling this research, they brought a case study where there was an individual who was uh, new into the corporation. And she was hired to clean up a department. And in order to do that, well, she, you know, she, she did all her evidencing and you know, identified the problem and figured out what the best way to solve it was. But because she was so new, it, she knew that people would reject her suggestion, right? Mm -hmm. Because who is this person who just comes in and tells us what to do? So what she did was she hired an outside consulting firm to work with her. And the consulting firm and her came to the joint conclusion but by saying, hey, this consulting firm, you know, here's what they're evidencing. She was using their credibility to support what she was proposing. So she hired literally outside support. Now, you don't need that if you've been in the company for 10 years, right? And you can show that. Right. Um, in the book, you talk about audience value. Um, and you talk about it like that it's like adding sugar to the cookie mix. Uh, what do you really mean by that? Why is an investor investing in you? They're investing in you. Why, why is an executive going to accept your proposal and you know, commit some of their resources to new project? 
it's not because the idea is brilliant. I mean, your idea could be absolutely brilliant. Nobody cares how brilliant it is. They only care about what they care about, right? An investor cares about making money. They want to make return. So you have a brilliant startup idea, but the investor needs to know bottom line, is this going to get me money if I invest in it, right? An executive might hear your brilliant idea, you know, might, but bottom line, an executive needs to know, is this going to help me get a better performance review? Is this going to help me, you know, make my department stronger so I accumulate more corporate power? So think about what it is that, you know, you introduce a problem and you introduce a solution, but why is this important to the audience? Why is it important to the person you're talking to? And then state that, translate that for them. You know, hey, the department's got a problem. You know, you go up to the executive of your department. Hey, the department's got a problem, right? Um, the executive's like, I hear that you say that there's a problem. I don't know that it actually affects me. Okay, maybe we're a little more inefficient, but I don't know that that would change the bottom line results of the department. You need to show that it would, right? You need to make it relevant. Exactly. I mean, you talk about in the book, low risk, high return, which people often equate with money, but it can be a lot more than money. It can just be what, as you say, what, what is your supervisor going to get in terms of positive things happening to the department as a result of, you know, whatever you're pitching, right? Absolutely. Right. Investor is easy. Low risk, high return, monetary, yeah. right? Um, yeah. If you're a social venture, maybe it's going to be high impact, right? You know, helping the whales, but if, you know, they care about whales, but if it's, you know, a, di a director, um, what, how, how does a director you know, understand what their value is? What do, what do they measure their own success by? And then explain how your idea is going to improve their success. Okay, again, we have some viewers. Uh, don't forget, please do ask questions, even if it's not related to elements of influence. Uh, if you're, I know that a lot of you are working on rough drafts of your pitch. If you're struggling with that or anything, um, feel free to pipe in and uh, ask Chris about that. Okay, so let's get again, go back to data. You, you went over it, but let's do it again because it's, it is really important. Um, it, you, you talk about how it makes the problem real. Um, you know, what do you think, what is the best data to really include? You were saying, you know, keep it, keep it brief, but what kinds of things really, what, you know, are they graphs? Are they, you know, what, what, what kinds of data uh, really help you in a pitch? There are two ways to think about data um, that just come to my mind right now. One is, of course, it's evidencing that what you're saying is true. You're saying a lot of people suffer with this. Show the number based on you know the, the, the evidence, you know the market research, just to back you up. That's one type of data, right? Just proves proves what you're saying. The second type of data emphasizes the value, right? That by showing the magnitude of a problem, for example, you're showing an implicit market. Uh, if you're talking to a person, you think it's going to earn them. Uh, this much return, use data to show from other companies how much return they have made, similar companies to you. If you're in a corporation and you're going to implement a new plan and you want to emphasize, you know, you, you claim that it's going to give this much value to the department, provide some data, maybe based on other departments or other cases outside your department, um, that that is in fact how much value they're going to get. Right? how much of an impact it's going to have. So those are some ways to do data. Can you ever use, you know, let's say you're, if you're inside a company and you're pitching something, you know, just, you know, what, what colleague, what you've spoken, you know, kind of unofficial data is helping to back up that, you know, or is that ever useful, do you think? I mean, you wouldn't call it hearsay, but, you know, uh, people just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss for what the word I want is. Um, well, it's in case studies like that, like examples, um, anecdotes. You see politicians yeah. use them all the time, right? So you know they're, yeah. they're effective. Um, right. I was talking with a person in the hall. I mean, that's a story, right? That's an emo so that kind of conveys a realness to it, an emotional. Um, in a sense, it is data, too. I mean, you are bringing up more than just your personal experience. You're bringing up somebody else's experience. So it is a one data point, you know, um, but it emphasizes a realness to what you're saying. That's really the goal here. Um, more than a formula, right? A formula is the first step. You need to be, if you're, in a, if you're a startup, you need to have be in the top one half of 1% to get funding. I mean, 
literally, if you think about it, the odds of going to the top business school in the world, um, whatever you consider it, Stanford, Harvard, um, there are other great ones, uh, Wharton, but it doesn't matter. But the point is, you know, the chance of you actually like applying to that school, getting into that school, and then graduating into uh, an above average salary, like a half a million dollar salary, you actually have better odds doing that career path than you do getting funding. It mm -hmm. kind of sucks, right? When you think about the odds, that's why we're doing this formula because the odds change so dramatically when you do the right things. Uh, just using a formula, maybe now you're going to be in the top 10% of pitches that an investor sees, right? That's huge compared to you know, the whole herd, maybe even the top 5%. But because it's still really hard odds, you need to take it that extra step, right? That extra boost. So what we're doing by adding these elements of persuasion is we're getting you from like, say the top 5% to the top you know, 1% where, okay, now your odds of getting funding are you know, significantly higher. Okay. We, do have a okay. we do have a question. Uh, it, it focuses, I mean, it goes beyond a little bit of the elements of the pitch, but again, that this is their opportunity to be able to interact with you, Chris. So um, from Atul, the focus on this course is a lot of the initial pitch, pitch and that's very helpful. Uh, what suggestions do you have for other slides that go beyond the initial two-minute talk track? Ad additional slides? Mm -hmm. Did you say? I mean, you're going to be going into that later in the course, right? Right. All right. So when you pitch, the most persuasive element of the pitch is you, not your slides. So I just, I mean, look, I got done coaching another guy this morning and he was saying okay how do i build my pitch with my slides and i was like no no you know forget the slides you need to talk without slides once you know what you're going to say then you can build slides to emphasize that and you'll learn that later in the lectures um, through this course slides are slides reinforce what you're saying but they're not the core of your pitch so i just kind of i know this is not answering your question yet and i will get to your answer um, but i just want to emphasize Never start drafting your pitch by drafting the slides first. Write the words. Once you have the words, then build the slides. You do it in reverse. The slides will restrict you. It will weaken your pitch, and it will reduce the odds that you get funding. You know, it's interesting, too, watching um, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, VCs, that sort of thing present now. There's a little bit of fatigue with PowerPoint presentations anyway, mm -hmm. and I'm noticing more and more people are not using slides. Um, that you're they, more they're just, without slides. I mean, like, yeah. unless you know, you're very specific slides, right? But slides have a cost, and, and so the slides have to make up for that cost. They'd be really good, anyway. What slides do you have after the two minutes? That's what is your question. And right. <clears throat> the answer is think about what the investor will ask. I mean, literally, you have to know what are the questions that come up that are not answered in your pitch. Um, more on the competition more on the market, more on some of your calculations, things you don't want to put into your, you know, you might not put into your pitch. Um, the details, the nitty gritty details, because uh, pitch is not about nitty gritty details. Um, it's about selling them. It's about getting their attention. Nitty gritty details, they lose attention. So don't explain how you came up with your calculations. Just give them the calculations and if they ask you a question, you have a slide to explain it in the back. Having said that, you know, you're going to talk to a lot of investors and they're going to give you a lot of feedback, and they're going to ask a lot of questions. It doesn't mean you necessarily need to put what they're asking into your pitch. It might if you see a trend, like, hey, they keep asking you the same things. Okay, great. Well, maybe that's something important that I need to think about. But if one guy asks it or, you know, over here and another guy doesn't, okay, maybe that's something you'd save for the backup, right? So if the question comes up, you can answer it. But don't, you know, weigh down your pitch with one random guy's feedback or, you know, requests because that guy doesn't know what he's talking about, right? You're actually much more persuasive than he is. You know, you know your product better. Um, you're the one selling it. He's just sitting behind a desk with money, whatever. And I want to, you know, I'm well, we're, well, this is going on. Let's just talk about money. A lot of startups, they have this fear that, you know, hey, the investor's got all the power. They've got all the money, right? I've only got my idea. You know, I just want to be frank. The idea is worth more than the money, right? There is so much money. There are so many people with money. There are God knows how many investors, right? Their money's doing them nothing. They're waiting. They're looking. They're praying somebody will come up with a great idea 
that they can invest that money in and use it. You're the person with the idea. You're the person of value, right? You're the one actually with more power if you recognize it because they need you in order to make money with their money. Without you, they're nothing. They just, right? So always remember that when you go into an investor meeting, value who you are, value what you do. And you're looking for good investors. You're not needing them. It's so true, Chris, because I've been working with a lot of VCs who are talking about that there's some really stiff competition among VCs, among investors for entrepreneurs. You know, entrepreneurs are always so frightened and feeling, oh my gosh, you know, I've got to convince them. But in reality, these days, I, again, if you have a good idea, investors are going to compete for you. And it's good to remember, like you said. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, let's get to the story, emotional connection. You know, what's what's the best way to kind of bring things to life during your pitch? Yeah, one thing I want to mention, you mentioned there, you know, there, there are a lot of people online right now. And I know you guys have questions. I know that we're, you know, Rusty and I are rapid firing you a lot of information, um, which, you know, it's taking probably some time to sink in. Uh, take a moment. Think about if you have any questions because I, I'm happy to answer them. If you have questions about pitches you've given in the past, and what did you do wrong? You know, feedback you've gotten, you know, things that in the course that, okay, you got it, but maybe you want to understand it a little more differently, right? Or even just totally random questions. Uh, this is a great opportunity for you to ask them. You've only got a few minutes, but it could, you know, it will serve you. If I can serve you, that's what I'm here for. Yeah, and Atul thanked you for, for uh, answering that qu that last question. I, th I think it is tougher in the beginning of the course because folks are just getting their feet wet and kind of getting a sense of it. Um, you know, maybe there's some way I can talk you into coming at the very end or something, and we have a question and answer period there. But anyway, let's go back into the story. Uh, you know, I, how important is the story, and, you know, what's the best way to bring it to life, kind of? Story makes your pitch memorable. So there was one investor I remember talking with. He's like, I hear a bunch of pitches every day, of course, but it's when I go to bed and the pitch is still, you know, that, that pitch is still on my mind. Those are the ones I know are worth looking into more. So by having an emotional element, some sort of story where they feel how your product's working and, you know, they feel from the perspective of a customer, they can imagine it and hold on to it. That's great. I mean, I think it's, there's data that says something like, you know, people remember stories about 53% of the time or 58% of the time and they remember data only 5% of the time. So your data is convincing, but it doesn't make it memorable, right? That's why the combination of story and data is so important. So to do story, it's, it's again, it's not sitting there explaining the problem and explaining the solution. It's showing it by bringing these examples and not a lot of examples, just like one example, you know, at max two, but like just one strong example that just shows, hey, here's how the product works, right? Or here's how people are suffering. Uh, can you have too many anecdotes or analogies? When do you decide, when do you sort of decide, okay, I've got enough, I can go with this? I mean, of course, so you can have, like the worst thing you can do in a pitch is have like a stream of data, like 55% of people want, you know, red, um, widgets and of those 55 percent you know four percent are you know between the age of 20 and 30 and, and of those four percent six 76 percent of them you know they go to movies at night it's like and you just get the stream of data and you're like where the heck am i right like what is the point it's hard for people to like take a lot of data and so you, you know give them one data point you know rather than a stream of data points um the same is true with stories so don't give them a stream of stories because they'll be like, whoa, one example, whoa, another example, whoa, another example, and none of them stick, right? One, you give a person one story, they remember one story. You give them three stories, they remember zero stories. You give them one data point, they remember one data point. You give them three data points, they remember zero data points. <laughs> so what's the best way, how do you decide when you've got a really good one? I mean, do you, is it good to, to practice it on people and see if it resonates, sort of, you know, a good analogy, a good anecdote? What's a good right. way to... This course, by the when you implement everything that you're learning right now, you're going to have an awesome pitch. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't get feedback because it is part art, right? You're knowing the exact mechanics of it. Um, it's like building a car, you know. You know you've put in the perfect engine now into your pitch, 
you've got the great brakes, you've got, you know, air conditioning and all this stuff. And, and you know, even the, the body of the car looks great. You drive it on the road and people are like, whoa, the color is orange. You're like, oh, I didn't even think about the paint. So, you know, with your pitch, you can craft, you know, engineer a great pitch, but you still need to test it um, to see if you've got the perfect engineering for the people. Um, and so if, if you've got, you know, three stories, try on different people each story. Some people will be like, yeah, that story totally got me. Others will be like, oh, that story wasn't quite as good. You use that. Uh, we have another question. It's not really about a pitch. Uh, I suppose it can be because you can pitch articles, actually. Um, I have recently started writing articles on LinkedIn to demonstrate thought leadership and technology and business. Yes. What suggestions do you have for that? I can see using some concepts already. Would love to learn more. You are already learning some of the most important elements to selling, literally selling, um, even though it's not sales. I mean, it, this is something we do in everything, in convincing people. Um, problem, solution, right? You start with a problem, people are hooked, then you give them a solution. You give them benefits, benefits of why. So let's say you're going to publish an article uh, on any topic, right? Hey, I'm going to publish an article on the new features of the iPhone. So you talk about what the features are and you explain, hey, here are some of the benefits. Or, you know, you explain why it's important for them to read the article. Like, hey, you know that there's a new iPhone and you know it's got all these great features, but if you don't, you know, but even with this, you might still suffer from this problem. And I'm going to show you through this article, you know, how you can maximize the use of your new product. Or if you read this article, you'll make the best decision when it comes time to think, which iPhone version do I want? Use the same pitch. Use the same techniques to pitch anything. Well, it's true because I was a former CNN correspondent, and when we pitched stories, even to our own producers inside the network, <laughs> we had to start with the problem. We had to hook them, as we, you know, you want to hook somebody, uh, and hooking them is often doing it through, as you said, pre presenting problems and solutions because uh, you, you want to show in news that you have a you know range of problems that are uh, that are going on that you know hopefully that there is a solution. Um, well, Chris, is there anything else you want to bring up before the end of the? I got a question for you. You 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 pitched articles. Can you share an example of a of a pitch that you gave? Mm, no, not mm, not really. I haven't in a while. I mean, I, I um not really. Not off the top of my head right now because I haven't pitched. I don't pitch. I pitch, I pitch news stories, but I can't. Something's you know off the top of my head. I'm, I'll have one for you next time, though. I promise. A woman. Once, I coached a woman once pitching a Hollywood movie, and um, you know, she, it, one of the things I noticed with that industry, and maybe it's true for you. That's why I was asking. Was really powerful focus on the story. Yes, um, absolutely. But still, don't you think it's a powerful influence on story for even a for a startup as well? You want it to, you want to have a really powerful story there. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Chris, thanks so much for joining us again. I, I may try to talk you into doing one before the the end of the course in in, the, in November. But um, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, thank you for the questions. And good luck on your pitches, and enjoy the course. Thanks again.